Okay guys and welcome to the video and what I want to do in this video is come on to a deeper look of the changes uh, to have a deeper look into the changes that occur in aggregate demand as a result of a shift of the aggregate demand curve as a result of an extra injection into the circular flow of income and remembering that essentially those two are you know measuring the exact same thing which is the desire and the willingness and ability of all purchasers to buy domestically produced goods. That's what aggregate demand is, the total demand for domestic production at different price levels, okay? Now, the thing is here, we've talked about you know things that can cause a change in the aggregate demand curve, right? So one of them, of course, is a change in government expenditure. And what you would imagine is that if the government just spent an extra 100 billion, the aggregate demand curve would shift right by 100 billion. But, and I'm sorry, just to be clear, to cite this, I got this from the uh, Intelligent Economist, this, this um, um, image here. And um, so if the government spent an extra 100 billion, just boom, the whole aggregate demand curve would shift outwards right by 100 billion at every single price level. This is the average price level up here measured by the CPI, Consumer Price Index, or the GDP deflator. This is essentially measuring the rate of inflation, okay? And we have quantity. Now, I don't really like that. That really should be real GDP on the bottom line. So this is the total amount produced. So let's analyze again, and forgive me for spending a lot of time just in the opening slide, but what is aggregate demand? The total demand for domestically produced goods by all purchasers at every different price level. And so, as I said, um, if the government increased um, um, government spending by 100 million, well then the aggregate demand curve would shift outwards by 100 million, no problem. Okay, but what we're actually going to see now, and we're going to take our first look into this, is this idea of a feedback loop, which is called the multiplier effect. And what the multiplier effect, which was worked on massively by John Maynard Keynes, the multiplier effect um, um, studies or is um, that there is an increase in transactions, an increase in buying that occurs beyond the initial increase, okay? Now don't worry too much about that, but I just want you to come back to this um, graphic over and over again in your mind when we're thinking about what the multiplier effect is. Now, keep in mind please, this will frame the first example that I give you, I know this is a first example, but still, that there are three ways to calculate national income, more on that in the next slide, and one of them is you add up total expenditure, and we know that aggregate demand is made of consumption, investment, government expenditure, exports, and minus imports. So how do we calculate national income, which is why? Okay, well what we do is add up all the first four, because all of these are injections, we know that from the circular flow of income, excuse me, and we take away income, all right, we, excuse me, we do not, we take away imports, all right, so what we get is a national income in this case of 500, whatever it is, if you want euro, it doesn't matter, okay, now, that's important that that is one way of measuring national income, and keep that in mind, you just add up total expenditure, Okay, another thing that I want you to keep in mind is that and we've looked at this in previous videos, so I'm not going to go into this now, but it's rule three, and these are my rule threes, okay, in, in macroeconomics. This is the total amount of expenditure on final goods and services. This is the total, all the different incomes earned by the four factors of production, okay, so this is labor, capital, land, and, and enterprise. When we add up all of these numbers, and you can pause the video now just if you don't believe me, you also get 21,000, so that's total expenditure. This is total income, so total expenditure on final goods is 21,500. Total, total income earned from producing those goods is 21,500. And this is the value of output at each stage of production, okay? The value added, all right? The extra value that was added at each stage of production. And if you add up these three, you also get 21,500. And what are we supposed to understand? from that, something very important, that if you can calculate national income three ways, so in the previous slide we saw that you can just calculate it by C plus I plus G plus X minus M, which is national expenditure. Here though, what I hope you see is national expenditure on final goods, final goods, uh, previous videos will explain that, okay, um, equals the national income earned from producing all of those goods, and that equals to the value of national output. And that is true too. So what I want you to keep in mind is that if you increase one of them, the others mathematically have to increase. Okay, now, 
I don't want to go on too long, but I won't sacrifice um, um, learning in order to, for expediency. I certainly won't. Okay, so what's the definition of the multiplier? Well, the multiplier shows the relationship between what? An initial injection, an initial bit of spending, an increase in total expenditure into the circular flow of income and the eventual increase in national income and GDP resulting from this injection. Okay, so if I spend money, national income rises. We knew that anyway, because that's total expenditure. But what I want you to understand is that it's a little bit more than that, and we are going to build up our model really, really slowly. As we saw from the circular flow of income, if people spend more, the national income increases, and that is true. Okay, because one way to add up national income is the expenditure approach. So if you spend more, national income increases. And savings, the definition of savings is that portion of income which is not spent. So this is very important to understand here, that um, um, your income, why, okay, you have two choices. You can either spend it on something, or I know I wrote C here, but you can either spend it or you can save it. And if we just mess around with that, okay, uh, and we bring savings over here, so Y minus savings equals total expenditure. I also could have brought the C over and let, left the S here, and savings equals your income minus expenditure. Now, if that's true for a person, if we up-level it, that is also true for an economy as well. Okay, so national spending equals national income minus national savings. Very important to know. Therefore, the more people save, the lower national income is in the short run. And this is true, and we know that because savings is a leakage in the circular flow of income. Okay. However, savers provide the funds for investment, which increases national income in the long run because it increases um, um, Q squared cell, the quantity and quality of uh, uh, capital, enterprise, land and labor. Okay. It increases the quantity and quality of factors of production. All right. One of them, it increases capital. That's what investment is, the production or purchase of capital goods. So if it increases capital, well, then our productive capacity is increasing, ceteris paribus. Okay. So the question... Is, is savings a bad thing uh, or a good thing? And the answer is, so we say savings is bad in the short run, but good in the long run. There's an opportunity cost for savings. And I would always, if you look at long-term growth and this thing called the solo growth model, um, what you do absolutely find is the rate of savings determines the long-run wealth of a country. Why? Because it directs more resources to making capital more resources to producing goods, the things that produce goods and services, more resources to producing the factors of production. And it is production uh, that in increases in production, increase our consumption. And we can only increase in production either by more or better or better used factors of production. Okay, now a long intro, I do apologize. Coming back to the idea of the expenditure approach. Okay, just the expenditure approach. Just think about this, okay? So Ross gets 10 euro in pocket money. That's not expenditure, okay? That isn't even income. It's a transfer payment, all right? A transfer payment is any payment where no factor of production has been supplied, okay? He's getting it in pocket money. He didn't do any work for it. The world is not richer because he has not produced anything extra. It is a transfer payment from his mother to him, from his dad to him, from whoever to him. Okay, so we are only going to count the economic transactions, not the um, um, distribution ones, ones of uh, redistribution of wealth. So Ross spends 10 euro in a clothes shop. Now, I don't know what he's buying because I'm Irish and you wouldn't buy anything in a clothes shop for 10 euro. But anyway, has he gotten an economic good? Yes. So expenditure has gone up by 10 euro. So national income has risen by 10 euro. And you're like, okay, John, yeah, that's the end of it. Well, it's not according to the multiplier effect. So the shop owner is now richer. You've increased their income. We know that income is one of the things that affects people's consumption. Okay, if you raise national income, you raise national consumption. So the shop owner is now 10 euro richer. So the shop owner now says, actually, do you know what? I will get myself that haircut this week. I was going to wait till next week, but now I've got that extra 10 euro. I'm going to wait. I'm going to do it this week. So now the shopkeeper has spent more money. Has production of a good or service occurred? Yes, it has. The haircut has occurred. That's a service. So what's the total expenditure in economic goods? Well, it's 10 plus 8, which is 18. Okay, all of this started by Ross spending that 10 euro. 
And then the hairdresser is like, actually, do you know what? Yeah, we'll go to the shops today because I, you know, got that extra company, got that extra bit of business. So I'm going to spend seven euro on groceries in the local shop. Well, the expenditure method as measuring national income is 10 plus 8, which is 18, plus 7, which is 25, right? And what did all of this and this extra bit of spending stem from? Ross's initial spending, okay? So when you spend money, the theory is that you're actually going to initiate a further round of spending. And if we measure, and one way, and it's an accurate way to measure national income, to measure real GDP, is, or to measure GDP at least, is to just calculate the total amount of money that was spent on economic goods, buying goods and services, well then this initial round of spending here from Ross has kicked off further rounds of spending. So therefore it's increasing national income by more than just the initial bit. Okay, so Ross, 10, uh, 18, 25, and the shopkeeper spends 5 euro of this on a taxi. We're up to 30. So Ross, okay, the initial injection into the circular flow of income was 10 euro. But the effect on total expenditure in the economy was an extra 30. Now, yes, Ross's 10 is in that, okay, but the net end effect was an extra 30 euro. So national income rose by more than just the initial injection as a result of the initial injection, okay? Now... We will say the multiplier is 3. So what's the multiplier? It shows the relationship between an initial injection into the circular flow of income, Ross's 10 euro, and the resultant increase in national income, the finished increase in national income as a result of that initial spending. Right, well, national income rose by 30 as a result of that initial spending. The initial spending was 10, so 30 divided by 10 is 3. Now, unfortunately, it's not always that easy to calculate, but still, okay? So an initial injection of 10 euro gave an increase in national income of 30 euro, a multiplier of three. The national income rose by three times the initial injection. Okay, now the size of the multiplier is affected by a number of things, okay? And in this video, we're going to concentrate by the, on the marginal propensity to consume, okay? But it is, and we'll define all of these things later on. But right now, it's the marginal propensity to consume or the MPC, the marginal propensity to save or the MPS. There is a relationship between these two. The marginal propensity to tax or the MPT and the marginal propensity to import or the MPM. Right, ignore this. I told you there's a relationship between these two. Look at savings, taxation, and imports. What side of the circular flow of income are they on? And you're absolutely right, they're leakages. So leakages will reduce the multiplier. Okay, now, the first thing I want to talk about is the marginal propensity to consume. So get the definition right. So the MPC is the fraction of any extra income. This is important, extra income. So if your income is 100 euro this week and next week it's 100 euro, you don't have any extra income. It's the same, okay? So it's the fraction of any extra income which is spent on consumption. So if I earn an extra 1 euro, okay, and I spend an extra 80 cent, right? The idea then, how do I calculate my um, MPC? The fraction of any extra income which is spent on consumption. Right, just so you know, if you're not sure uh, what a euro is, it's a hundred cent, okay, just in case you weren't, okay, it's like a dollar. So, it's 80 over 100, which equals 0.8. Okay, but how did I work that out? So, what's the, the, the formula for the MPC? It's the change in consumption, my consumption rose by 80 cent, divided by the change in income, and my income changed by a hundred cent. Okay, so it's 80 over 100 equals 0.8. Okay, now, you must forgive me for a second. So maybe if you take a photograph of this and um, um, we can go through um, these answers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, exit out of this. Um, so take a photograph of that now, exit out of this presentation and then go on to my document camera. Okay, so the first one we're going to look at is Matthew earned an extra one euro. That's a hundred cent. He spent 70 cent extra. Calculate his MPC. Okay, well, I'm going to get out of this. You can still see those screens there, and I'm going to go here, and we're all good. Okay, so what's the MPC? Well, the MPC, excuse me, equals the change in consumption over the change in income. Right, so let's go back here. 
What was the change in income? The change in income was one euro. What's the change in consumption? The change in consumption is 70 cent. So what we're saying is the change in consumption is 70 over 100 because there's 100 cent in a euro and that simply equals 0 0.7, okay? So what we're saying here is the MPC in this example equals 0 0.7. What we can conclude or extrapolate from that is that if everybody in the economy earns an extra one euro, everybody will spend an extra 70 cent of it. That's what we can, that's what we can conclude from that. Back to the next question, okay? Mark earns an extra five euro. He spent three euro extra, okay? So let's go back here, okay, MPC, equals the marginal propensity to consume, the fraction of any extra income which is spent on consumption, okay? Now, he, sp he earned an extra five euro. I don't need to put it into cent now. He spent an extra three, and that equals 0 0.6 if my maths doesn't fail me. So therefore, what we can say in this example is MPC equals 0 0.6. Uh, and forgive me, the document camera is slightly behind. So what that actually means is, if we up-level that, if we can find the MPC for the entire economy, what we are saying then is that if everybody in the economy earns an extra 10 euro, they will spend an extra 6 euro. That's all we're saying, okay? Uh, keynote, yeah. Okay, so Luke's wages. Now, you must forgive me, I'm going to write this down. Well, I mean, Luke's wages okay they went from 100 to 120 okay so the change the change in his wages equals it's always 2 minus 1 120 minus 100 equals 20 euro that's the change okay so that's the change in income equals 20 euro okay just so you can see that i hope that makes sense okay and his spending went from 80 to 90 a week, okay? So it's always two minus one, okay? So the change in consumption equals 90 minus 80, which equals 10 euro. So what we're gonna say here is that the change in consumption equals 10 euro, okay? I'll write all of this down there. Delta C equals 10, and delta Y equals 20. And just to be, you know, complete, I suppose, in all of this, the MPC, the marginal propensity to consume, the fraction of any extra income, any extra earnings that you spend on consumption is 10 over 20, which equals 0 0.5. In this example, the MPC equals 0 0.5. Okay, now forgive me, I'm, I think I'm writing all the way over the page, but still I hope it, 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 it makes sense. Back to this now, okay. So John's wages went from 200. Now I understand that all of these are individual examples, but we'll get to a proper macroeconomic example with question five. John's wages went from 200 a week to 240 a week. Okay, so I'll go down a little bit here. So the change in income equals... 2 minus 1, 240 minus 200, which equals uh, 40, okay? So what we're saying here is that the change in income equals 40 euro, okay? I hope you can see that, and you must forgive me, I am writing skew ways here. Okay, and then um, his spending uh, went from 100 to 120, okay? So his spending, so delta C was 120, it's always the second minus the first, equals 20 euro. So delta C equals 20 euro. Okay, so the MPC, therefore, is the change in consumption over the change in income, change over change, okay? And what that equals is 20 over 40, which equals 0 0.5. In this case, the MPC equals 0 0.5. If that was true for the entire economy, what that would mean then is that if everybody in the country earned an extra 10 euro, um, then total spending would increase by an extra 5 euro per person. Okay, that's what we're saying. And then the final one, in, a national, in an economy, national income was 5 trillion, I think that is, okay, 5,000 billion in 2012, and 5,050 billion in 2013. Okay, so let's... That's national income. Well, we know what national income is. We call it Y. Okay, so it's 5,050 minus 5,123 equals 50 billion euro. Okay, and excuse me, 
That's the change in national income. So therefore, the change in national income equals 50 billion. Okay, Ooh, sneak it in there. All right, now, what we're saying is total consumption in the economy, all right, total C, went from 3,000 to 3,020, 3,000 billion, I almost said 3 trillion, to 3,020 billion. Okay, so the change in consumption equals 3,020 minus, excuse me, okay, 3,000 equals, um, what do we have here, which is uh, 20 billion, okay, so the change in consumption equals 20 billion. Uh, euro, <laughs> my God, all over the place here, guys. Okay, so the MPC, the marginal propensity to consume, well, it equals the change in consumption over the change in income. What that, in this example, equals 20 over 50. If you want, cancel, cancel, which equals 2 over 5, which equals 0 0.4. In this example, the entire MPC for the entire economy equals 0 0.4. Any extra income that is earned in this economy, 40% of it will be spent on consumption. Now guys, I really, really hope that helps. We haven't done the multiplier yet. All we have done is looked at what is marginal propensity to consume. It's the fraction of any extra income which is spent on consumption. And I suppose here is the formula for it. It's the change in consumption divided by the change in income. Uh, we'll be going on to the simplest version of the multiplier in the next video. And thank you very, very much.